everybody. I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Z Garcia. And I'm Mike Delicio. Today we're taking a look at Harrow County, the game of gothic conflict. This is from uh, off the page games. It is, uh, their games are based on literature, although this is the second one based on a graphic novel, and their next one I think is also based on a graphic novel. That's correct. I, I, I think it's specifically graphic novels, comics, that are, that is the, the, the goal of the company is to kind of merge board gaming and graphic novels and, com and comics. Now, now, going into this, Mike, had you read this comic before you played the game? No, it, it, exactly like their first game, Mind Management, I came to the comics from the games. And um, honestly, they're, they're, they're kind of three for three for me because they have an upcoming one and I've been reading all of the comics and they've all been great. Yeah, I read the comics for Harrow County after I played this game the first time. I was curious about it. I, I get why people like it. It's not my style. It's very gothic horror um, and a lot of wibbly-wobbly. I'm not sure everything that's going on in it, but I get the basic story. The basic story is a woman is a witch. She's sort of helpful, but the townspeople just can't stand her witches, witchery, and so they burn and kill her and everything. They hang her. She dies. And they bury underneath a tree, and in that tree they find a baby, and that baby grows up and they think, is this the witch again? We're not sure. That baby is the hero of the story and of this game. And then the witch's relatives are another faction in the game, and her evil sister, and that's not a spoiler because you find that out like one second after she's introduced, is also another faction in the game. Okay. So you have not read the books. So I you're just going not. by gameplay. That's right. So... I'm going to show you a bit of the gameplay. There's a lot going on in here, folks, um, and then we'll be right back. So what you're seeing here is an end game state, and this is a two-player game between the family and Cammy. There is a, another faction, the Protectors, and mostly the game can be played three-player, although if you play with a three-player game, you need to add Hester into the game. But the two-player game, which is a good chunk of what's in the box, you're picking one of these three factions and playing against the other. The game rule book comes with chapters and so you will go through each chapter and each chapter adds more things to it. And I'm not going to be able to go over all the rules in here. I'm just going to be able to give some of the basic overviews of the game. Players are trying to get to seven points and you'll keep track of your points here. This is like a double spinner because one of the ways to get points in this game is by killing your opponent's haints. They're like their minions. And whenever you beat an opponent's minion, you get a point. However, you then move this spoon up here. You now need to kill two minions to get a point. And if you do, you move it up to three. There are other ways to get points. We'll talk about them later. I do want to mention, though, the main mechanism of the game, each round of the game, you have these mason jars here. And players have the same four mason jars. You're going to pick one and activate it on your turn for an action. If you're the first person to activate it, you also get the bonus that's on this tile here. And then your opponent will pick an action and activate it, maybe getting a bonus. Then you'll do that. But you're only going to do three of the mason jars. One of the mason jars, the fighting one, when you activate that, you can also, on a future turn on the same round, activate another one and also use that as a fighting one. That's what that token shows you here. There's some basic ways to get points. Controlling the middle section here at the end of a round will give you a point, although it is easier to kill people in that spot. The family is trying to build storms from their starting spot up to these houses that will be placed on the board by your opponent to destroy them, giving them two points. The protectors are going to be moving family members, trying to get them to safety. They're also going to be on the board, and you're going to have to chain move them back to your starting spot. While Cammy is looking for a doll. Not this tile, and so the opponent's going to put them around almost like the hide the pee game, and you have to figure out where this dial is to get points. There are three basic actions in the game, and players are able to augment those actions, but the actions are movement, which lets you move on the board, which is pretty easy for the most part. It's one space into a spot, although anyone playing against the family has to pay an extra spot to move in a storm, and if you move on a mountain, it costs extra movement. This here increases your strength. Each of the, there's a place over here where players are going to be keeping their cubes that they get 
over the course of the game. And that's essentially your strength. The more cubes you have here, the stronger you are. And the plus sign is going to allow you to put more of your minions, your haints, on the board. Now, each player will activate these in different ways. For example, the family here, they have a bag that's going to start with tiles in it, and they are going to be, as they move around the board, these tiles will be laying around the board. They can collect more tiles, and they'll be able to build their bag the way they want, or they can put the tiles on the board, which means they can't use them, but will allow you to pull more. So in this instance, this player is now pulling seven tiles from the bag and discarding two of them. And so they can manipulate that, and they can even upgrade and get better tiles in here. The protectors and cami are different. Um, the protectors just will pick one of their actions and do as many of that action as they can, and it just gets stronger and stronger as you move it up. While cami is going to use this little board here where they'll take a tile, move it down to a row, and then activate all three in that row, and that will be equal to the strength of what they are here. Not as strong as their protectors, but they have more options. And all three things I just mentioned are when you activate this mason jar, so it's activated differently for each person. The same for each person is this tile here. When you activate this one, you take a wild token here. You start with one, and every time you take the action, you get another one, and then you can take any of those actions I just mentioned, and you can do it that many times. So the more times you take the wild action, the stronger it gets. Players are going to start with their main character here, and you can pick there's a lot of different options on each one. You can pick the main character, Emmy, or you might want to be Priscilla or the skinless boy. While well, if you're playing a family, you'll pick one of these people. And Cammy is always in play, but will come with various goblins that she'll be able to bring into the board. So this gives you a special power. One of these jars that you have will let you activate the special power here, but it will also let you activate a special power underneath your board which is going to be different depending on which of these sides you'll pick. When you pick these special powers, like for example, this one lets you put paths on the board, which makes it easier to move your people. So whenever you activate your special power, you get to do the power of your person plus the power of your faction. For example, the, the, the family, their power is putting these storms out on the board. And as you go around collecting tiles on the board, if you get any tiles that show, a special symbol, you can put them on here, making your family's power, well, more powerful. Combat is resolved using a cube tower, which is built directly into the box. It's hard to see here, but in here, when you drop cubes and they fall out the bottom of the box, uh, you are going to, not all the cubes are going to fall out. So when you fight someone, you're going to throw in cubes according to your strength. So I will go up here, drop them in. And a lot of them come out, and yeah, there's a tray for catching them. And you'll see which ones have come out, but some cubes are still in here. You'll see if I knock on it, they might fall out, and they'll stay in there for future turns. And then when cubes come out, you can spend them for the, to eliminate the haints of the opponent who you're attacking, which gives you points, remember. Or you can push their main characters around, which will also eliminate haints and give you points. So that's basically the game. I do want to give them credit here for their trays. This is a tray for one of the factions, and you can see how everything just really fits in smoothly. Your characters fit here, um, and it it's really works well with lids, putting them on, and the components for this game are just beautiful. But in a two-player game, first person to get seven points is the winner. Okay, game production values, I think, are off the charts good with two notable exceptions. Mm -hmm. I think they're fantastic. I mean, the, the, the bins, the way everything goes in the bins, the, there's a sheet that tells me everything that goes in the bins. It's beautiful playing the game. It's easy. I don't have any problems with symbols and everything, except we, I know you keep getting the, the grow and strength and the... Well, the pause and the bite... Yeah, I'm thinking the plus, I keep thinking like, plus strength, right? No, that's the bite. The plus symbol is an extra haint or whatever on the map. And yes, I had a little trouble with that. Sure, but I mean, other than that, fantastic. Here's my two problems. One is this here. I understand that it's cool 
to have the, the cube tower in the box. But it's clunky for me because it's, you don't use this much of it, and therefore I have to stand this whole box on the table. I know that Mike's going to say not as big of a deal, um, but I, I just wish there was a better way, and I also don't like holes in the box. The game's like, hey, just put the lid on sideways, and then you don't have the hole in the box, but still bugs me a little. Okay, okay. A bigger issue for me is the rules are written in chapters. Chapter 1, Chapter 2, Chapter 3, Chapter 4. Very useful to learn how to play. Mm -hmm. Not nearly as useful when I need to look up a rule. I don't know what the solution is other than putting in another whole rule book. I think that's the way to go. Do it like Fantasy Flight does it. Give me that one how to learn, like, learn to play book, and then that, you know, this is all the rules as a reference guide book in here. I can look through that one once I know how to play. I'll, I'll respond to, to both of those because uh, I have, have some thoughts on both. Um, the components, I agree with you in the sense that for the most part, they're very, very good. Um, and for the cube tower, it's gimmicky, right? It, it is absolutely gimmicky, especially if you know the story, though it's kind of fun that it's actually the tree, right? Um, but the, the one thing I disagree with is that the extra space, because you, if you're playing with the Hester faction, which is the, the if you're playing a three-player game, you have to play with that, uh, then that uses that center part of the, the battleground. The issue I have with it is that, um, so there's, I think, one very good thing about the tower and one thing I don't like very much, which is that there's no perfect place to place that uh, battleground. No matter what, some cubes are not going to fall in that tray. It's just every game, some fall out, some come shooting out, or, you know, past it. So, so that I don't love in that, you know, it would be more satisfying if they always landed in that battleground. The thing I do like about the cube tower is that this is one of the best versions of a cube tower in the sense of it's very good about trapping some cubes you know, some cube towers, you use them, and there's not a lot of suspense. It's like, okay, it may trap one of these. I agree. This, it really traps them. Yeah, it's really good. I, I mean, that last time we played, when we were done playing, we were cleaning out the tower. You kept smacking it and shaking it, and things kept falling out of there. Yeah. We, even when we thought we were done, it's like, boom, oh, there's another no, one. No, when I brought the box in here to review it, there was another, another cube one. fell out. I was like, what? I, I, I agree <laughs> with that one. They knocked it out of the park. I don't know what the inside of this thing looks like, but they, they made it a legit cube tower. It's very good. Yeah, and, and, and the rule book I did want to talk about, too. Um, it's tricky because I, I, I this publisher, I think, has kind of tried to do rule books as a reflection of the source material, making them almost comic-like. I don't know how functional it is. They always kind of look cool. Uh, their first game, Mind Management, a lot of people struggled with the rule book. Um, I, and I kind of did too, uh, because it was just done in a way where it was trying to differentiate through colored text, you know, from different aspects of the game, and, and it could look a little busy. Um, and in this one, they do this chapter system, which I think on a practical level, I understand why they did it because this is an, a very asymmetric game. There was an element of asymm asymmetry in mind management too, but um, it's much more so here. And so they tried to kind of like take you through the steps. My concern, uh, my main concern about the rule book this way, one, I do echo that it's harder to do for reference. Um, I think they might have an index in it which helps a little bit if I'm right, but I'm not positive. I would have to look at it. Um, but the big issue I have is that I'm afraid that there are going to be some people that are learning the game and they play chapter one and that's all they play because maybe they don't own the game, whatever the case may be, and they think that's the game. It's not. The, the, you're, you're not getting the full experience until you go through chapter three. Um, and so that's my main concern there is people think that they've played the game when they've played Chapter 1, and you really haven't. Yeah, and, and really it's that the whole different chapters and going through. Like I played Chapter 1 without Z, mm -hmm. and then I was like, I think Z could handle Chapter 1 and 2. But I'm glad we did that because adding the, the – we then jumped to Chapter 4. Yeah. But that was a lot of extra stuff. Sure. And I'm, I'm concerned – 
If I teach this game to someone who's never played before, I want to teach them the whole game. There's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. And I don't know the best way to teach them. Maybe teach them chapter one and then like wipe the board after a few turns and be like, okay, now here's how it really plays. It, it's a little tricky, but this comes into a bigger thing that this is not particularly a complex game, but it definitely is weird in many ways. It's going to use a lot of mechanisms you understand, but it combines them in ways I've never seen before, which I know Mike's going to say is fantastic, and, and I'm not disagreeing on that, but this is definitely going to appeal to a limited audience because of that. Yeah, the, the, the way I kept feeling, and you were definitely, again, running the games as we played each time we played. It was mostly you, you know, in charge of the, the rule book, the rules, questions, that sort of thing. I just kept finding, the word that kept coming to mind was, this is so esoteric. And besides that, it was really abstracted. I mean, I know that they are based on the, the graphic novel, and I like the characters, and it's sort of, some of the ideas I can extrapolate flavor out of, but that central board and moving on it just felt abstract. Yeah, I'm, uh, you know, I'm like moving around to make connections to things. I'm moving to the center to control it. I mean, stuff like that is just abstract. That's what it felt like to me. But then on top of that, so much of it is esoteric and weird and not convoluted in the traditional sense of too many rules going on, just sort of feels backwards, and I had a hard time getting a flow, getting a sense of, okay, top of the round, I flip one of these, I do the thing, okay, do that three times, reset, that flow wasn't coming uh, as much as I wanted it to. Yeah, I, I, I think that didn't bother me as much. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think the flow of the game was pretty good. There was a few weird things. The, the first player token piece that when you take it, you immediately get another turn, but at the end of your turn, you're giving it to your opponent. It was a little weird to me as opposed to just take the first put, person token and you go first next turn. And the, the me, the part I struggle with the most, and I read the rules many, many times, was combat. The cube part is easy. Throw the cubes in, but then it comes out. A tie favors the attacker. I mean, I'm, I'm learning it now, but it's not necessarily close. And then you close. have to spend cubes from it. Two cubes if you're here, but one cube if you're here. And then if you have more cubes, you can spend those, which is very rare because yeah. of the way the tower is built. Sure, sure. And then they can attack back, but only in certain situations. And then when you hit the opponent, if it's a main character, they move back one and you kill Haint anywhere. If it's a Haint, they die. I, I, I got it, right? But it doesn't come naturally. It's not, it's not easy. That's, I just want that to be clear to people watching this. you you got to kind of earn this game a little bit. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, I agree. That's a very good way to put it. And that's why I think that the people that are going to like this game the best are the ones that own it <laughs> or are in a dedicated game group with somebody who owns it and everyone likes it because it's not something that's going to, it's not a game that's going to reveal itself on the first play uh, at all, even if you're playing the full game. Because when I have taught the game, I have taught it to seasoned gamers only so far, and I've always taught the full game um, because I, I just, I feel like you're not going to really get a sense with that, really all of that, that, that training uh, chapter one thing does is show you very basic ideas of here's what this side is trying to do, here's what that side is trying to do without any of the card play. It just leaves out too much for me. Um, so it is esoteric, it is weird, and it is gonna take at least a play or two to wrap your brain around. I do agree in a sense with the, the combat, um, mainly in the sense of you, you think it's gonna be straightforward of, okay, if you're attacking somebody and you have the advantage, you've got more units than they do, you get an extra cube bonus, cool. Easy to understand. You take the cubes from both sides, you pop them in, you would think the normal way to resolve combat in something like this would be whoever has more cubes comes out, wins the combat, right? That's not exactly the case. You have to make sure that uh, you, you have enough cubes to spend to defeat you know, a haint or, or a legend. Um, and so that is a little bit odd. I think it's good though. I mean, I really do like that system, but you're right in that that's just one example of, of many where the game kind of plays around or, or subverts the common type of 
tropes you see in, in games, right? So it's like, I've, I, I expect this to happen. Oh, it, they do it a little bit different. I expect this to, oh, no, they, they, it's a little bit different from that. Because centrally, it's a path-building game, right? And I do agree with Z. It's, it's quite abstract. Um, I mean, it's a hex-cubed, you know, a hex-shaped board with hexes on it, I should say. Um, and in some sense, what you're doing is almost a pickup and delivery uh, for, for the two main factions. It changes when some of the other factions come in. But again, in a slightly different way. So... It's this trade-off of, am I willing to go through the extra effort to understand how this game handles these types of mechanics, or am I not? Yeah, I, I want to be clear here. So I, I, I've been talking about how difficult the game can be to get into, and it has some weird things. I really like it. And a lot of the reasons I really like it is because they threw in everything I like. They threw in a cube tower. I love cube towers. Sure. They threw in bag building or, you know, building a pool of tokens in a bag for the one faction. I think that's fantastic. And they give you, like, pick three out of four actions, and the one action gets better every turn. The taking the wild tokens. I really love that. I like the idea of victory points for various things and asymmetry. This is one of the most asymmetric games I've played in a long time. Yes. You're essentially taking the same actions except... You play so differently. Well, they mean different things to each side. Right. Yeah. And that's such a... So all that working together means I like it a lot. I want to ask Mike real quick. I So I, I've not played the three-player part of this and what you thought about that. Yeah. So it, the, the way the game is set up is that for a two-player game, you can play the protectors and the family... Uh, against each other, or you can add in this cami character, right? So Sure. Basically, you have three factions. You pick any two of those factions, you're fine. Correct. In a three-player game, you have to play, one player has to play the Hester faction, the witch, right? Every three-player game has to include uh, Hester. And it's really interesting because, again, it's so different from what the other players are doing. What you're trying to do as Hester is you are collecting cubes that are corresponding to the different terrain. And so you're laying down these little um, path tokens, which are branches, basically like they're representing the roots. I think they're like root, uh, to uh, root tokens. And you put them out and depending on what squares they are, you get colors of that cube. So you're gaining the, the strength from the different regions and what you're trying to do is get haints from the other two factions together onto a single terrain. And so you're building up cubes, but you can have more cubes as the Hester faction. Normally you can't have two haints on the same hex. That's one of the fundamental rules of the game. But when Hester is in the game, that's the way that they basically get their points. Um, they, they, they infect them by putting little snakes in their ears, which are actually little plastic snakes. And uh, if you can then pull one from each faction onto a single hex and they've both been infected, then that's how you're going to get a point. Um, it's really interesting. It plays, I think, very well. I do think that the core of the game is probably the two-player game. Um, but the third player is not just, uh, you know, this is thrown on to please Kickstarter backers. It's a, I think it's a fundamental part of the game, and it is a very viable three-player game. I have not played it at four-player, though. You need an expansion for the fourth player. That, that, that fits in the box if you want to play with that. Right. Um, all right, so what would you think of it? I, uh, I'm going to give it a 6.5. It's not quite there for me. I just uh, I really appreciate and respect this game more than I like it at the end of the day. I think it's a very well put together game. It's clearly well researched. It's clearly well thought out. I think Mike put it uh, uh, very well when he said that it's a game that subverts what you expect of it. A lot of ideas, mechanisms, uh, asymmetrical pursuits that are reached at in a slightly different way than you would expect. And I respect that very much. I just didn't find it to be that fun. That central board is simply, and, and the core game, really, that core loop, just felt too abstracted to me. I did not enjoy that after I pick my character and the way in which I do what I do, my strength pursuits and my hangs and messing with the other player, I then just sort of play 
a connection abstract uh, uh, that feels like you could strip all that theme away, and I would mostly be playing a, a you know black versus white pieces kind of abstract game. So for me, 6.5. I liked it. Uh, okay, I, I enjoyed the theme, and it is one that's probably going to inspire me to check out the, the book, actually, the graphic novel, but it wasn't quite there for me. So I think reading the graphic novel helped me a lot. I, I bet, yeah. Um, but it helped me basically inject theme in a sense. Like, oh, I use, when I, I play Cammy, I'm like, oh, I know how she is. You know, I know how she acts. I know how, oh, this, 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 the skinless boy here, I know what he does and everything. So that helped a bit. I love this game. I think it's really fun. I, I've not played three players, so take that in mind. But I feel like there's so much space in just a two-player game. Like, I haven't actually played the family because every time I play someone, they want to play the family. And I get it. But, I mean, I'm just by watching play, I'm like, that's, that, I think it's my favorite faction because <laughs> I've never played them. But I think all three factions are fun because I can try different things, but in that same space. Also, the game is fairly quick. It says 45 minutes in the box. Yeah. I think you could drag it out to an hour, easy, but that's still okay by me. It feels like when you're done, you've played a pretty in-depth game. Now, there's a bit of setup, and, like, and there's a lot of rules overhead. But once you get through that, I just found myself really enjoying this. It's different, but it's different good. Because different, you know, we just talked about this, different isn't always good. Sure. Sometimes things are different to be different, but in here... I just, I found myself enjoying each thing. I would never play not the full game. Like, I would never right. go back to chapter one or two again. They were nice for learning step purposes, but I wouldn't do that. And I, and I worry about the number of people who I could teach this to. Sure. You know, like, there's not many people here, I think, who would want to play it. But I guess I could play it with Mike. You know, uh, it's, really, it's really entertaining for me because I suspect Mike's score will also be higher. You haven't said yours yet. Oh, did I? I said 8.5. Oh, I'm sorry, 8.5. 8.5, really enjoy it. Yeah, I, I was waiting on that score. I'm like, did I miss something? But no. Um, In my head, I said it. Good. That's where it counts. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to repeat what Tom said, although you echoed many of the thoughts I had going into the game. I was even going to bring up that you had on a recent uh, board game smorgasbord episode talked about innovation and how sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not good. If it's innovation for the sake of innovation, that oftentimes leads to games that just don't feel right. This is innovation done correctly in the sense that I do think, I, don't, I, I, I can't speak for the publisher, but the sense I get is that this is a bit of a boutique type of an audience they're looking for, right? They're looking for the intersection of people that are interested in comics and graphic novels and board games. And that's a pretty big Venn diagram, but their games definitely go outside of the, uh, they don't stay in the middle lane, right? Mind management did some weird quirky things with hidden movement. This is doing some weird quirky things with path building. And so I think it's going to have a relatively limited appeal. But if you're in that, that Venn diagram, man, I love my management. I love this game. I'm giving it a nine. I'm, I'm you know, close to you there, Tom, but wow, this game to me is just so satisfying. And I agree. There's a learning curve, but if you get people that all are, are into it and learn the game, um, you can just have some great, great sessions because I have. I've, I've been able to introduce this to people. It's not been out a long time, but I've been able to introduce it to people and play it with people, and it goes over really well. Um, you know, now, again, I've had people that have been interested in it. You know what I mean? If I just set this down randomly at a game day or at a convention, I may not have as great a luck because it is a little bit more niche in what it does. But uh, yeah, if, you, uh, if you're intrigued by the asymmetri asymmetrical play, if you're intrigued by a graphic horror you know, setting, even though it is abstract, but, uh, or if you're a fan of the, of, the, of the book and you're a fan of board games, it's a no-brainer. You need to try it. Uh, but overall, mechanically, I think it's really, really solid. The production is off the charts. So it's getting a nine for me. I think it's outstanding. Well, there you go, folks. That's Harrow County. I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Z Garcia. I'm Mike Delicio. Beware the witch. Stay out of that tree.